haven't for the previous Sundays, come on. There are three elective courses, and you may step into them. For example, my wife is uh, teaching a course on face stories, and uh, Beekner will be the author looked at tonight. And uh, one of the three, uh, Kirk Knight uh, Programs for Adults, which concludes with Vespers from 7 to 7.30 in the Vanguard Room. The officers, elders, and deacons are reminded of the stewardship program this evening. We eat at 5.30, joining others who are here for Kirk Knight Adults, and then the officers will be involved in a stewardship program with Dr. Benjamin Sparks, uh, pastor of the Second Presbyterian Church of Richmond, and uh, Ben's uh, in-laws are in this church, the Reverend uh, Mr. and Mrs. Murphy Smith, Murphy and Margaret Smith. We continue with the orientation class for members, prospective new members, and we had a large class this morning of approximately 12 in it, and we're thankful for that. And if you're here and you'd like to join that class, uh, please feel free to come at uh, 945. Uh, during the Sunday school hour, we meet in the Balkan Paula, this room to my right, uh, to your left, where we have coffee, and we talk about it a lot during the service, during the announcements. Our uh, prayers are for the following individuals. Uh, Jim Sell, who was in the mountains, uh, who's come down with pneumonia. Dr. Al Edwards uh, from eye surgery, he's doing well. Sheila Barrick, our director of Christian education, had surgery and will be convalescing for a little over a month. We are mindful of others who are in the hospital. Uh, Bruce Poole, who is at Rex. The baby, uh, whom we announced uh, just about two weeks ago. Uh, Andrew Spencer Bryce Eklund, uh, whom they will call Spencer, among those four names. Has surgery at Memorial Hospital uh, involving a constriction of an artery uh, behind his heart. Uh, Wilbur Marshall is at Raleigh Community Hospital. Uh, Jane Nurse is at Wake Medical Hospital. Our Christian sympathy is extended to the following individuals, to our extended family at Peace College. We are closely related to Peace College. And there was a death by car accident of one of the secretaries uh, who has been on staff for many, many years, uh, Annette Strickland Woodard who was the secretary to the register, uh, Dr. Bob Pace. And so uh, thoughts are, and prayers are with uh, the Wooded family and to the college and academic community at Peace College and the uh, sudden and tragic death of Annette. As well, our Christian sympathy is extended to the family of Jim and Ann Tyler and the death of Ann's 103-year-old mother, uh, Mrs. Arthur Ann Fountain, who is also the aunt to Ben Fountain. Uh, in, in this part of North Carolina, everybody's related to everyone else, and so uh, the fountains are quite numerous, and uh, we have these representatives in our church, as well as many others in the Tarboro area. So our thoughts and prayers are extended to these individuals. To bring us a moment of permission on behalf of our stewardship program is the moderator of the uh, stewardship committee on the Board of Deacons, uh, Mr. Doug Kamen, also a member of the Sanctuary Choir. Doug. By now, I hope all the members of our congregation know that next Sunday is a special Sunday here at First Presbyterian Church. It's Consecration Sunday, and it's special for several reasons. First of all, we will have Dr. Scott Woodmansey from First Presbyterian Church at High Point to bring us a message on stewardship. Second of all, Dr. Covington, Sue Crocker, Leslie Trantham, the Chancel Choir, the Chapel Choir, and the Handbells will all be presenting special offerings and music next Sunday. Following each worship service next Sunday, there will be a free brunch, a chance for us to get together, celebrate, and fellowship, having made our commitment to God. And fourthly, and the real reason that next Sunday is special, is that we get the commitment to God of what we are going to do with our with this church. I hope you all plan to be here. In preparation for next Sunday, we need you folks to do a couple of things. First of all, if you haven't turned in your reservations for brunch, we need you to do that this morning. You can do that either by turning in the 
reservation card that was mailed to each member of the congregation, or you can take the pew cards and fill those out, uh, indicating on the, the pew card, if you use it, whether you're going to attend the first brunch or the second brunch. We need the, that information in order to be able for the kitchen staff to plan the amount of food that needs to be prepared. The other thing I'd like you to do is during the coming week, think about the many blessings that God has given each and every one of us and what he does for us each and every day. He's truly faithful. As in all communities of faith, he blesses each of us differently and to lesser or greater extents, but he does bless each and every one of us. And as a result, we should feel a desire to give back to God a portion of what he has given to us. I will hope that as you consider your commitment next week, you'll remember that the Bible teaches us that the tithe is the standard, and our church officers have challenged us to become a tithing congregation. But far more than anything else, I would encourage you to be in prayer and read your Bible, listen to the things that go, around, go on around you this week, seeking God's will for what you would do. In closing this moment for mission, I ask that you all bow your heads with me in a word of prayer. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you now giving you thanks for all the many blessings you so richly provide for us. We ask that you be with us as we go through this week, that you lead us and guide us and make us aware of what you would have us do, even starting with the words of this worship service today. This we ask in the precious and glorious name of Jesus Christ, your Son and our Savior. Amen.
Would you please join me in our responsive call to worship? Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into God's presence with singing. Enter the courts of the Lord with praise. Let us worship God. Let us join together in the singing of our hymn, All People That on Earth Do Dwell, number 220. spirit. Let us admit our sins before God and one another, first praying together and then in a time of silent confession. Let us pray. Gracious God, though your light shines in our hearts, we often cling to the darkness. Though you have given us an unfathomable treasure in Jesus Christ, we act indifferently. Though you offer us extraordinary power through Christ, we have relied on our own power. Forgive us, make us whole, deliver us from the harm that binds us. Help us to live in your light and walk in your ways. For the sake of Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. Hear the good news. If we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. My friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Alleluia. Amen.
We welcome all to worship at First Presbyterian, and I invite you now to reach for the friendship pads as we reflect the oneness of the body of Christ as we gather for worship on this fall Sunday in October. A special welcome to guests and visitors. There is a card in front of you with a red ribbon on it. It would be helpful to us if you would put that on so that um, worshipers sitting in front of you or behind you may extend to you a warm greeting. Uh, those individuals did not have the benefit of the friendship pad. A special welcome as well to those of you who worship with us by way of television. We are First Presbyterian Church in Raleigh, North Carolina, and we're located across from the state capitol at the corner of West Morgan and Salisbury Streets, and we're thankful that you are joining us for worship on this Sunday. We're thankful for your prayers. We're thankful for your financial contributions, which help to underwrite this special ministry. If you are a guest or visitor here this Sunday, uh, we invite you uh, to join with us in Christian discipleship. There's a place to check on the friendship page, your interest in receiving uh, information about the church in the way of brochures or in the way of a visit. And if you'd like to speak with someone at the close of this service, there is an officer in this room to my right on the other side of the pulpit who is prepared to talk with you about how one becomes a member by transfer of letter from another Christian body or by reaffirmation of faith if you have been not active in the life of a church for some time, or by profession of faith and baptism. And if you are here as a student or you're in the military or you're in business and you're here for a short period of time, there is a procedure also of affiliate membership whereby you do not transfer from your home congregation, but this becomes your church away from home. And that designation uh, is carried for two years, that of being an affiliate membership and can be renewed. At the close of the service, uh, we invite uh, members and guests alike for some coffee and fellowship in the Balkan parlor. It's a day like we had in Scotland during the summertime uh, for about 10 days. It was like this for 10 days uh, in the mid-50s, but fortunately the sun came out after that. But uh, we drank a lot of tea, and so we don't have tea here this morning, but we do have coffee. And so at the close of the service, if you'd like some coffee to warm up before you head out into the, the drizzle, uh, please join us in the Bark and Paul. We'll make room for you, believe me, if you come. And we look forward to greeting you there. The pastors, after we greeted the doors, will go to that room, and we look forward to greeting you at that time. Our hymn is Come Christians, Join to Sing, Hymn 150. Let us all pray. 
Almighty and merciful God, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. The Old Testament lesson is Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. This is the story of Cain and Abel. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a tiller of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the first fruit of the ground. And Abel brought of the firstlings of his flock and their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. But for Cain and his offering, the Lord had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is lurking at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must overcome it. Cain said to Abel, his brother, let us go out to the field. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? Cain said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me this day away from the ground, and from thy face I shall be hidden. And I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will slay me. Then the Lord said to Cain, not so. If anyone slays Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who came upon him should kill him. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod, east of Eden. The Gospel lesson is Mark chapter 12, verses 41 through 44. Jesus sat down opposite the treasury and watched the multitude putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums, and a poor widow came and put in two copper coins which make a penny. And Jesus called to his disciples and said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her 
poverty. She has put in everything she had, her whole living. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. A friend called me one evening after I had mentioned Cain and Abel in a sermon. She wanted to know why the Lord accepted Abel's offering but rejected Cain's. It didn't seem fair. I told her that I would get back to her. When I called her back, I told her that I agreed it did not seem fair. The story of Cain and Abel is puzzling, even troubling. If God can reject Cain's offering, apparently for no good reason, then God can reject our offering as well. Or to put it more bluntly, if God can reject Cain, as my little friend in Brooklyn would say, for no poipus, then God can reject us. You remember the story. Adam and Eve have two children, two sons, Cain and Abel. Cain has a small vegetable garden. Abel has a flock of sheep. One day, the two brothers decide that they will bring offerings to the Lord as a kind of worship. Cain fumbles around in his fruit cellar and finds some vegetables from the summer's crop, some potatoes, a squash, a turnip. Cain brings some of what he has. But Abel slays his choicest lamb and brings the best cuts. The Lord looks at the gifts and tells Cain, you didn't try very hard, did you? Cain flies into a rage. The Lord tells him, to calm down. If he does well, everything will be all right. But Cain doesn't believe it. He's too angry. When he gets his chance, Cain kills his brother Abel out of spite. John Steinbeck retells the story of Cain and Abel in the great novel East of Eden. He changes some of the details, but he keeps the part about gifts. Steinbeck shows that the gift is important because of what the gift means. In Steinbeck's story, Adam Trask has two sons, the fair and pleasant Aaron and the dark and brooding Caleb or Cal. In the movie, based on the novel, James Dean plays Cal. More than anything else, Cal wants to please his father. But when Cal brings his father a gift, the old man rejects it. Cal has made a fortune off the misfortunes of other people. The time is World War I, when a smart investor can make a killing overnight. Cal strikes it rich on beans. He buys low, and when the price jumps, he makes 15 grand. Cal wants to give the money to his father, but Adam Trask won't accept it. He thinks of the small farmers who have lost money on beans. He thinks of the young soldiers who have lost their lives in the war. 
When his father rejects the gift, Cal unleashes a chain of events that leads to his brother's death. The point to keep in mind when thinking about the Genesis story of Cain and Abel, or Steinbeck's variation of it, is that the meaning lies in the nature of the gift. The gift is important because it symbolizes the person who brings it. What devastates Cal is that his father rejects him when rejecting his gift. The gift represents Cal. The gift represents the giver. As we reconsider our commitment to God this autumn, we need to keep in mind that deeply religious truth about gifts. The gift represents the giver. It should be clear that the Lord wants our best. None of us has to match another person's best. What the Lord wants from us is our own best, our own best efforts, our own best expenditure of time, our own best of everything we have to give God. Cain's problem is that he brings less than his best, and he knows it. When the Lord tells him the truth, Cain can't stand it. He lashes out in anger. Shortly before I graduated from seminary, I wrote a paper for a professor who was known for telling students the truth. Students avoid teachers who tell the truth if you want to feel good about yourself. It was a hectic time. Judy had just given birth to our firstborn. I had just accepted a call to my first church. The last thing I wanted to do was write that paper for the mean-hearted Seward Hiltner at Princeton Theological Seminary. All I wanted to do was get by. The professor's comments were devastating. He said that if I hadn't learned any more than that paper showed, I had wasted my time. When I read the comments, I felt terrible. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized that Professor Hiltner was right. I needed to hear what he had to say. I hadn't come close to my best. I had avoided my best. With Cain trying to get by with less than his best, the Lord calls his hand. Cain is infuriated, but he must know that the Lord is right. Some analysts are saying that giving less than one's best is a true mark of the dog days of the 20th century. Giving less than one's best characterizes our time. It wasn't always that way, but it is now. In commenting on the baseball playoffs, Thomas Boswell, writing in the Washington Post, suggests that lowering standards for postseason play is just another indication that we Americans easily settle for second best. Each major league has three divisions. In order to add another round of postseason play and make more money, Teams finishing second in their respective divisions have become eligible. 
the best of the second best now qualifies for the playoffs, such as the Florida Marlins. If the ball bounces just right, the wild card ends up in the World Series and under certain circumstances may even win the World Series. Now those of you who do not live and die by the box scores must consider this an arcane discussion. But Thomas Boswell raises a troubling question. Why should we expect that baseball a mere institution should hold to its century-old standards in the face of a society that fears and dislikes high standards and wants them lowered. It should be clear. It should be clear from the story of Cain and Abel that the Lord wants our best. No wonder the biblical message receives a bad rap in America's desperate quest for mediocrity. It should also be clear that the Lord wants what we're least willing to give. Only you and God know what you're least willing to give. Maybe it's your chronic criticism of other people. You try to hide it, cover it over, but in your heart of hearts you keep dragging friends as well as strangers over the coals. Or maybe it's your view of yourself. Behind that bluster is a vulnerable person a person who is so vulnerable that fear of being hurt is the worst fear. You don't risk much because you don't want to fail. Failure is worse than not trying, you feel. Or maybe it's your appetite for what's hurting you. You know it's damaging you physically or emotionally, but you can't stop. Just one more time, you tell yourself. Just one more time. But you don't stop. Or maybe it's your money that you're least willing to give. Don't be surprised if it's your money, because having money or not having it comes close to expressing a person's worth in our society. I found a statement by Halford Lockock, who used to teach at Dr. Stock's Yale Divinity School, about the difficulty we have surrendering our money to God. He uses the analogy of times long ago when entire armies of primitive peoples were baptized and declared on the spot, Christian. Many warriors marched into the baptismal waters with their sword hands held high out of the water. Then they could say, this hand has never been baptized. They could keep on swinging that battle axe with ease. This hand has never been baptized. The modern counterpart of that partial baptism, writes Luckock, is seen in many people who have been baptized, all except their pocketbook. They hold these high out of the water. But the Lord wants what we're least willing to give. We'd better think what that is. The Lord knows, and the Lord will stay after us until we give it, especially if it's something as expressive of ourselves as what we possess. 
It should be clear, therefore, that what the Lord wants from us is ourselves, every part of us, not just the parts we readily give. Remember that the gift represents the giver. The Lord's argument with Cain is not about vegetables. It's about Cain. The Lord wants Cain, fruit seller and all. When Cain brings less than his best, he's cheating his maker. He isn't willing to surrender himself completely, entirely, wholly. One day, Jesus uses a poor widow as an example of what God requires from us. Jesus is in the temple watching the people as they put their money in the offering box. The wealthy are putting in large amounts. Along comes a poor widow who contributes coins worth about a penny. Jesus turns to his disciples and says that the poor widow has made a larger contribution than all the rest. But how can that be? Haven't the others contributed much more? Of course. But the poor widow has put in all that she has, her whole living, says Jesus. What God wants from us is our whole living, ourselves. You know about the Salvation Army. What you may not know is that it was founded among the poor of London in 1865 by a man named William Booth. Booth's daughter Evangeline, better known as Little Eva, made the Salvation Army a force for good throughout the world. She traveled widely, and wherever she went, she carried with her the crude wooden table at which her father, William Booth, made his commitment to God. A small copper plate was nailed to the table. On that plate read, God shall have all there is of William Booth. Put your name in that statement and you'll understand. God shall have all there is of me, of you. How much is enough? How much of Cain? How much of Abel? How much of you? How much of me? All there is of Cain and Abel. All there is of William Booth. All there is of you and me is enough. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Page 14 in the front of the hymnal. Let us say what we believe. 
I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son of the Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us offer to God now our prayers of thanksgiving and intercession. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for human life, for relationships, for getting up each day and being able to talk and to move and to think and for breathing the fresh air of fall. And now at this season, seeing the change of colors, we thank you for being alive and sharing life in relationships with family and friends and colleagues. And in the stewardship season, we thank you for the gifts entrusted to us to share with others. And as we taste the goodness of your creation, and as we are mindful of these gifts, we are thankful most of all for your Son, Jesus Christ, the greatest gift to us, who lived and died and lives again for our salvation. Hear our prayers for others. This day we pray for those shaken by doubt or by depression because of family situations or personal problems or difficulties at work or with illness. Enable the gift of your spirit to those who care for them to enable them to see that in the midst of brokenness there can be healing. That in the midst of brokenness there is the strength of your presence for support. Gracious God, we pray for families and for the extensions of family. We pray for those who marry and become part of extended families. We pray for parents and for children and grandparents and aunts and uncles and cousins and nephews and nieces. We pray that in the family, both parents and children may know security and joy that in the web of family, we may know that we have worth. And we're thankful that our Lord Jesus Christ endorsed little children and the role of the family. And gracious God, we pray for this human family we know as the Raleigh and the Triangle area. We're reminded that Jesus longed to protect Jerusalem as a hen gathers her young under her wings as he cried over it. And we ask you to guard and strengthen all who live and work in this region. Enable us as Christian disciples to be a caring people. Enable us to work for good schools, good housing, good medical services, good police protection, good social services, all of which benefits your children, rich and poor of every social and economic status, because we are your children and we are bound one to the other because of having you as a creator and redeemer in Jesus Christ. And gracious God, we ask your blessing on May we be open to the many opportunities before us to proclaim and to live the gospel of salvation through Jesus Christ. The power of this gospel to turn lives around from despair to hope, from bondage to freedom, from death to life. The power of this gospel to work through us as we are instruments of justice and mercy, as we are advocates for all people, the powerful and the powerless. 
Gracious God, we ask too your blessing on our efforts and ministry through this congregation. As we look to the 21st century and the opportunities before us for ministry through our capital funds campaign, that this may not be simply a campaign for brick and mortar, but that this indeed is a spiritual campaign for the proclamation of the gospel, for strengthening us to do our best and to offer our best to the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. O oh, divine physician, give rest to the weary with heavy burdens. We ask that you would heal the sick in body, mind, and spirit. Lift up the depressed, befriend those who grieve, comfort the anxious, stand with all victims of abuse and other crime. We are mindful, too, that you are with those who are near and dear to us who have had surgery, so we lift up these individuals, Sheila Barrick, Al Edwards, Wilbur Marshall, Spencer Eklund, James Nurse, Butch Poole, Jim Sell, convalescing from pneumonia. Others who this week will have chemotherapy or radiation or kidney dialysis. And we ask too that you would be with those who have lost loved ones. We ask that you would be with the family at Peace College in the tragic auto death of Annette Woodard. Be with the family of Jim and Ann Tyler and the death of Ann's 103-year-old mother, Mrs. Arthur Fountain, who is the aunt of Ben Fountain. Be with others in our church family, too, who have lost loved ones, who are very keen this day because of these losses, because of anniversaries and special occasions. O oh, gracious God, we offer these prayers in the strong name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we respond to the gospel, we do indeed offer to God ourselves through that which symbolizes ourselves, our tithes, and our offerings. Let us now continue in worship as we offer to God ourselves.
gracious God. We are mindful of the gifts of life, and we are mindful that as our Creator and Redeemer, you call from us our best because you held nothing back from us. You gave us life and salvation. And now as we respond to the gospel of life, of hope, of forgiveness, of courage, of stamina, we respond with our gifts to you. Transform them by your power that they may become instruments of the good news of the gospel to all of your people. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our hymn is the hymn, Lord of All Good, hymn 375. Go in peace. Go in the strength of God's Spirit. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all and all whom we love, both now and forevermore. Amen.